at approximately 10 minutes past 5 p.m. on a Saturday afternoon on the 20th of September 1975. An explosion occurred in the underground workings of the Koanga No. 1 mine near Maura in central Queensland. 13 men who were underground at the time of the explosion, who were attempting to seal off a fire that had developed from spontaneous combustion in the GOF area of the 4 North section, tragically died. The severity of the explosion and the conditions after the explosion dictated that the mine be sealed, entombing the miners below ground. An inquiry was held in Rockhampton, conducted by the mining warden with the assistance from four persons having practical mining knowledge. The inquiry commenced on the 10th of November 1975 and closed two weeks later on the 24th of November 1975. The Koanga mine was worked by a Borden pillar system, having three surface portal entries to enter the mine. The portals were accessed by a box cut down to the seam at a depth of approximately 20 metres. The main headings were extended in a westerly direction along the seam dip, approximately 1,100 metres, with mining districts 1 to 5 extending northwards from the main headings. The travel distance from the surface portals to the four north in-by areas would have been approximately 1,400 metres. The dip of the seam was approximately 1 in 7 in a westerly direction. This would have made the vertical depth of 4 north approximately 140 metres from the surface. Strata support at the mine consisted of wooden props, crowns and some roof bolts. Mining of the 4.2 metre coal seam was carried out by way of continuous miner and shuttle cars with conveyor belts to transport the coal to the surface stockpile. The maximum extraction height was 3 metres, thus leaving a 1.2 metre upper band of coal in the roof. The coal left behind once collapsed in the gulf was susceptible to spontaneous combustion. Methane had also been detected in the mine workings. The inquiry found that an explosion was initiated by a fire which had developed from spontaneous combustion. The fire ignited methane in the gulf, in turn propagating into a much more violent coal dust explosion. Whilst the explosion flame did not reach the surface, blast waves of the explosion exhausted from all three portals and the fan shaft with significant force. The blast resulted in catastrophic damage to all three portal entrances, complete devastation of the conveyor structure and the housing of the main ventilation fan. As you can see from the photos, a motor vehicle parked at the top of the ramp suffered irreparable damage. This vehicle was a considerable distance from the portal entrance. The extraction of four north panel was expected to be completed within a period of six months from March 1975. This was believed to be the incubation period of spontaneous combustion of the coal. The panel extraction had progressed until the 12th of August when the miners annual holiday started for approximately two weeks. However, an industrial dispute resulted in further production delays of a further three weeks until the 19th of September, the day prior to the explosion. There had been previous spontaneous combustion problems at Kyanga. As far back as 1972, heatings had occurred and as recent as the 8th of September 1975, less than two weeks prior to the explosion, a fire had occurred in the return near the Upcar Shah. There was a belief that the Kyanga coal had an incubation period of six months. On the 19th of September, Official reports had reference to warm spots in the 4 North Gulf, but conclusively had all reported that the heating areas appear under control. At 6am the next morning, on the 20th of September, a deputy reported a fire near 7 Cutthroat in the 4 North District. Smoke was reported to be coming up the main return. 
what went through my mind is, geez, you know, we haven't got the bloody Drago. I don't want to go any further. But uh, the manager was sort of a bit concerned and wanted to find out what was happening. By 7.40, the manager had determined there to be a spontaneous combustion or possibly even a fire, and that the district needed to be permanently sealed with haste. By 11 a.m. Temporary bradder stoppings had been erected with the intent to seal the district whilst allowing some ventilation to dilute the gas and the heat behind the stoppings. Meanwhile, smoke built up and had increased behind the temporary stopping. You, could, you couldn't see the fires, like it's all, all the pillars being taken out, so it all fell down. And um, you just couldn't see the fire, all you could see was the smoke. All they could do was keep a check on the gas and try to seal it off as quick as possible. Industrial grievances were put aside and a number of volunteer workers had already arrived before afternoon shift at the mine to assist with the erection of three permanent brick stopping. The permanent seals were to be situated just out by of the temporary stoppings at four cut through. We had to get a machine out the road too. They wanted, didn't want it to be sealed in there, so a lot of that delayed the actual sealing process, unfortunately. Uh, and then by the time they got blocks down there to bricks, like brick blocks to seal it, and that all took time. Delays cost lives, and no question about that. And also, we didn't have an appreciation, certainly I didn't, and none of the other blokes, or the, I don't think the mine manager either had an appreciation of just how dangerous it was. Sealing operations continued throughout the day. At 5pm, Deputy Fletcher called to the surface to make his report. This was to be the last communication with the men working underground. At approximately 5.10pm, witnesses on the surface reported a popping noise and lights flickering before a deep explosion. Smoke and dust billowed from all three mine portals and the main fan shaft. It was immediately apparent that there had been a serious explosion underground. 13 men in total were currently underground involved with sealing operations at the time of the explosion. By 5.30pm, Mind Rescue and all other necessary support services had been notified of the explosion. The Blackwater Mind Rescue teams arrived at the mine at 8.45 that evening and set to work to assess recovery operations. Decisions were made within the hour that was not safe to enter the mine due to the risk of fire and potentially another explosion. Throughout the night, rescue teams and mining engineers tried to assess the environment below ground by taking gas samples via boreholes above the Four North District. Several samples in succession are shipped by air to Brisbane, which was the closest laboratory for chemical analysis. Each sample analysed and reported back stating that all indications support that the mine is currently on fire. The following day, on Sunday the 21st of September, by 8.45pm, over 24 hours from the time of the explosion, critical decisions had to be made. It was concluded that there could be no survivors amongst any of the 13 miners who had been trapped underground at the time of the explosion. The conditions of the mine post-explosion dictated too great of a risk for any rescue team to re-enter the mine. Sadly, agreement was set amongst all legal and necessary parties involved at the mine that the mine must be sealed in order to control the fires and reduce the risk of a secondary explosion. It's a, it's a terrible experience. It's a, it never leaves you. I, I can remember that day as if it was yesterday. You know, just, um, no, it, was, it stuck in my mind a long time. I couldn't even talk about it. Um, no, a very good mate of mine, uh, Eric Fletcher was a deputy. He was the last bloke I'd see his face. Um, I spoke to him as I left. And another fella who was going down the mine, I spoke to him. He was in the open cut and uh, he didn't know anything about underground mine. And I said, uh, oh, stay with, just stay with uh, you know, the older blokes and they'll look after you. And, uh, he said, it's going to be all right down there, Bill. I said, yeah, you'll be all right. Just stay with him, guys. He'll look after you, you know. And uh, you know, it's stuck in my mind that, you know, like I've sort of, you know what I mean? 
and because I thought, I knew it was hazardous, but I, mean, I never thought it was going to blow up. He, he explained mining, he explained um, the inquiry. Um, you give us the facts. Yeah. Like, you've heard all these things from family and friends and well, kids all overhearing over years. things that they yeah. shouldn't overhear and not getting the full story. We've lost our dad, 12 other families lost their husbands and fathers. Like, did any good come out of losing those men? You know, um, why was he down there in the first place when there was a fire? Like, we, it seems silly. Why go underground when you know there's a fire? But that was all explained to us, like what they were doing, why they were there, why it was important. You know, he was doing what needed to be done to try and put the fire out to keep his job, yeah. for all the miners to keep their jobs. By 9 p.m. on Monday, the 22nd of September. All mine entries were finally covered. Further material continued to be pushed over for another 10 hours so as to improve the seal efficiency. The bodies of the miners from Kyanga have never been recovered. <laughs>